so thank you very much indeed for arranging this at such short notice to have a, a discussion with you. And indeed, I have done a book, but that's really not the main reason for coming to talk to you. It's really everything is still going through a fairly dire phase, I would say, and I'd quite like to get a bit of a reading from people in Dublin about where they think everything is going. Uh, I have to say I'm not particularly optimistic about what's gone on in the last couple of years. And so if I could divide my talk up into about five bits, I'd like to first of all say what I think has been going on. Um, secondly, what are the big lessons we can somehow draw out of this? Some of, sometimes it's really rather uh, rich and, and deep ironies. Um, thirdly, I would like to elaborate on what I talked about when I was last here in Dublin, and it may be a little bit fanciful, but I talked about a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So I'll go into that just a little bit. It may not be the absolutely top priority. Um, the, the fourth thing is really the, the new European order, such as it is, and, and Germany's role in it. And, and fifthly, what might happen next? You know, what should happen, what could happen, and what might happen? So those are the five bits. Um, well, first of all, just to go through the rebalancing of the European economy, there clearly has been some progress, but it's all been at the brute force uh, level of recession and unemployment, forcing big falls in demand in all the countries that got hit by the absolute imbalances that we had up until 2007. And most of the rebalancing and the reformulation of some positive current account positions in many of the peripheral countries um, has been caused simply by a fall in imports. I think Ireland is the exception there. I think you have genuinely recovered competitiveness and the internal devaluation method has actually worked in Ireland. You, you are the pooster child. Sometimes you're made a little bit too much of your you're, you're painted in technicolour when perhaps you only deserve to be in black and white and that's done for all sorts of political reasons. And, and no doubt the Irish economy uh, is still in a pretty slow momentum mode, as we saw with the latest figures which came out just, just yesterday. But I would say for the large body of the peripheral countries, we haven't actually seen enough happening um, to really justify any great optimism. I, I think the OMT, which was launched by Mr Draghi about a year ago, has been a gigantic bluff. He's a very, very clever and resourceful and alert and intelligent man. And I know quite a bit about how this was, um, how this came out. There was an element of luck about the whole thing, I would say. It has worked up to a point, but I don't think it's going to be used. And therefore, I do think there will be a time when the markets do start to call the bluff of the peripheral countries. And somebody somewhere will say, well, when are, when are we going to actually use this? Because the whole point about having a nuclear deterrent is that it has to be credible. And because we've had so much turbulence about whether or not it's even in line with the Maastricht or the European treaties, and there is still a constitutional court action pending in Germany, I, I don't think it's actually operable, the OMT. And so Mr Draghi and his colleagues would clearly like to keep the nuclear deterrent going. But when you've got the defence minister saying quite regularly, I don't know whether the missiles in the silos are really ready for action, uh, and even if they were, I think they may be a Supreme Court judgment against us pressing the button, then it's not quite as bad as the defence secretary defecting to the Russians. But you can see what I mean, the, the Cold War... The Cold War metaphor, I think, is apt. Uh, it does actually take away something of the credibility. But because of the latest actions of the United States or the idea that the Americans may be tightening, this has certainly come at an inopportune time. In terms of some lessons that we might have learned from the last couple of years, I think one awful lesson is that it's been absolutely proven true that to make the European Monetary Union work, you do need a much greater degree of political integration and federation than we have up to now. This was said, of course, right at the very beginning, and uh, therefore it's not a very original thought. But the, but the terrible dilemma and the paradox is that just as it's become more obvious that that is what you need, it becomes less easy to do it because there's been so much loss of faith in Europe uh, everywhere, whether in the debtor or the creditor countries. And so going from this position of 
really a very poor economic uh, situation and massive unemployment uh, throughout much of Europe uh, and also massive loss of confidence in the future, also among many young people, towards uh, a proper federal Europe where those countries that want to be part of a proper union would do so has become enormously difficult. And, and, and that is, I think, the crux of the matter. I think we're seeing also the, the limits of technocrats in all this, uh, the way that the Bank for International Settlements at their weekend report, which they always spend many months poring over, making the point that central banks have only got very, very limited possibilities in, in all this to get growth going again. This copies something which Draghi and his people at the ECB have been saying now for many months, you know, do not... Uh, overestimate the powers of the European Central Bank. Again, this flies in the face of one of the original parts of the construct, which, which was that the ECB would be very much at the heart of a kind of European growth machine. Certainly people in France very much believed uh, all that. Another new point which seems to have been taken on board uh, just recently is that we're not going to go back to the uh, very narrow spreads between uh, stronger and weaker economies or creditor and debtor countries that we had up until 2010, until the Greek crisis broke. Now, th for me, that's not a very new point because the Bundesbank has been saying that really for about four or five years. But it, it now seems to have worked through into the consciousness of many people that even if we do get out of this very severe bout of crisis that we have now, the countries which have always in the past been weaker than Germany would continue to be held back by a rate of interest which will be higher than the ones in the core. And that goes very much against the fundamental construct of the euro, which was that you gave up your ability to manipulate your exchange rate, but in return for that you got a permanently lower interest rate. That, that part of the contract has now been breached. And I think that's quite a, a new state of affairs that people now are, are slowly coming to, to terms with that. Another thought which has now come through and uh, permeated itself into the consciousness, uh, is that when the euro was formed, everybody thought it was their currency. But in fact, they were wrong. It's nobody's currency. Nobody's in charge. And it's a foreign currency. Very interesting to see the views of the Spanish uh, politicians, diplomats, technocrats. That they thought that the European Central Bank might come to their rescue uh, when they got into dire straits in, say, 2010-2011. Um, in fact, the European Central Bank didn't see that as part of its business to buy up peripheral country bonds. And also they realised that they had been issuing debts the whole time in a currency which wasn't theirs. And this has now come out in quite a number of scholarly tracts by uh, senior Spanish uh, policymakers that they suddenly realised that it wasn't their currency. And once you give up your own currency and you're borrowing in somebody else's currency, uh, you do give up a, a great deal leeway, you can't actually manipulate that currency. It's quite clear the ECB is not a central bank like anybody else. It can't do quantitative easing. It can't play around with the interest rate. The, the power of the European Central Bank is vested in this 23 man. There's not a woman there, so it is a man council, which remains astonishingly opaque and occult, and of course very anti-democratic as well. So we, we don't have a very good setup for governance. Another irony is that the whole point about monetary union, or one of the points, was to try to make Germany as harmless and as powerless as possible, and the Germans readily concurred with this idea. It was, it was viewed as a good thing by the whole of the German political class that the whole bandwagon towards monetary union, which had been building up steam before the fall of the Berlin Wall with the Delors report and all those things, should be... Uh, catalyzed and accelerated. One of the reasons was indeed to try to emasculate Germany, to stop the Germans ever being a nuisance to anybody ever again. I always thought that was very fanciful to instrumentalize the currency uh, in the interest of some overall political diplomatic endeavor. I, I really didn't like that idea at all. Uh, in fact, it's turned sour because uh, Germany is stronger than it has been for, um, I would say, the whole post-war era vis-a-vis -vis France, and yet he doesn't actually want to be strong, he doesn't want to be powerful, he doesn't want to be in charge of anything. And I don't think the Franco-German relationship will break up because it's extraordinarily symbiotic. The, the Germans need the French to cover up the fact that the Germans are actually quite powerful, but they don't want the world to know about it. And the French need the Germans to cover up the fact that the French have become extraordinarily weak.
and yet they don't want the world to know about it. So you've got this huge kind of psychological symbiosis, which I don't think is particularly healthy, but at least uh, it's got a certain kind of logic to it. Um, the whole point about the euro as well was to try to promote the single market and to try to promote European trade and investment integration. That has really gone backwards. The, the Germans are now integrating with countries outside the euro area. Because of today's logistics and technology, you can transcend geography. So if, if, if not by the end of this year, probably by next year, uh, China will be Germany's most important trade partner, e eclipsing France. Germany, as everybody knows, is doing a massive amount of trade with countries outside. The amount of trade that all the big European countries are doing with each other has fallen, um, not just Germany. So, again, an irony of the whole situation is that rather than promote intra-European trade, uh, it has done the opposite. And maybe the, the final irony is that the Americans, despite all their wrongdoings and all their false starts and all their manifest feelings in their own economic management, they're still absolutely top dog. So the old idea, propounded above all by France, that the euro would somehow knock the dollar off its... Uh, perch at the top of the world stage uh, has now been exposed to be a very shallow illusion because the exorbitant privilege of the dollar is alive and well uh, and back with us. Um, just a few words now about this idea of a kind of reckoning. Uh, this is my third point. Now, I do accept that this is not the right time to have some sort of tribunal uh, of the uh, technocrats and I do think it's the technocrats above all that do need to be uh, named and shamed here. But I do think the monumental, um, almost criminal negligence and incompetence with which this whole, this whole setup has been developed does deserve to be looked at. Because this is akin to going into fighting a war with the army ill-trained, <coughs> the generals um, arrogant and out of touch, the, the, the weaponry... Uh, rusting, and all the defence lines not brought up to scratch. This is, has been Europe's metaphor of the Maginot line. And what, is it, what made it all the worse is, was the appalling complacency of the people in charge of this. I'm not so much talking about the politicians, because you don't always expect the politicians to really understand these things, because they're just put in charge for a relatively small amount of time. You, you do expect the people behind it to understand, but the reckless incompetence and complacency with which this whole thing was described a shorter time ago as 2008, it does need to be looked at. And in, in this new book, but also in my old one, I've listed quite a number of these cases. I won't get into all the details now. Interestingly, uh, Mario Draghi, who, of course, wasn't really one of the select band of people who were actually in charge in the early years of monetary union. Uh, part of the time he was at the Treasury, and then he went to join Goldman Sachs, and then he only went to join the Italian Central Bank in 2005. Um, he said some very outspoken things in his tenure as European Central Bank chief. He, uh, he, he says far more in his speeches and his remarks in a few short words than... Jean-Claude Trichet says in a whole uh, month of Sunday sermons. And Draghi has used the words, the long complacent amnesia of all those uh, actors at the heart of the European project. And I, he was kind enough to comment uh, on one bit of my manuscript. He, he told me he didn't mean Jean-Claude Trichet here. He meant really the Euro group, so I'm, I'm willing to accept that that was the criticism that was put forward. Uh, another extraordinary statement, again, it's been completely on the record and it's been, therefore, um, it must have been commented upon, but I, I find the vice president, the new vice president of the uh, ECB, don't forget all the six man, again, it's all men, so I can say man, the six man executive board, it's all changed in the last two years and they're much more competent and more realistic set of people. Um, he has said comprehensively that the, the faults in the construction of monetary union were not fiscal. It, it's a complete nonsense to blame the uh, errors and the faults uh, and the misturnings on the inability of countries to fulfil the stability and growth pact. That's complete red herring. We know that from Ireland, we know that from Spain. You were fulfilling these uh, 
these targets um, dramatically well uh, up until about 2007, 2008. Uh, it, 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 it was monetary. The, it was unbridled, credit fueled booms in the peripheral countries, driven by the ability of countries to borrow and live beyond their means. The European Central Bank, in the form of Mr. Constantia, has now said this black and white. So, this is, in a way, the equivalent of uh, when a change occurs in the Kremlin. You know, an old set of slogans, an old set of shibboleths gets put to one side and a new set comes in. One of the points that I have criticised um, my good friend Mr Trichet on, uh, and, and he knows this, is that for about five years uh, Jean-Claude Trichet regularly praised the fact that German and Greek debt was priced at the same level, the convergence of 10-year interest rates. He praised this in speech after speech, so it was not a secret as being a great prize and a great boon for 300 million European citizens. Uh, the European Central Bank has now revised the old doctrine. That's all now part of the uh, past history. Uh, and they now officially say that was an invitation to, to moral hazard uh, on, on a very grave scale, which I think it was. So we've seen um, so, some quite big sea changes in the last, uh, in the last three years. I think there should be a tribunal of inquiry at some stage, but I think it should be done only when the most manifest um, signs of the crisis have disappeared, and therefore I don't imagine that this will take place or can even be thought about seriously for several years. Um, the Germany's position I've already alluded to, I don't think it's any point asking the Germans to suddenly reflate their economy and produce an inflation rate of 4% and go into current account deficit and rage, raise wages in order to bring the rest of Europe uh, out of the mess. Firstly, I don't think it would do any good even if they could do that. I think it would have all sorts of counterproductive effects. If you give the Germans more money um, by cutting taxes, they tend to save more because they always fear the wolf coming down the road. The Germans act differently when they, they, when they give them money. They don't go out and spend it like the feckless uh, Anglo-Americans. They, they, they save it. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. Um, but, so I, I, and also, it has been well proven that the Germans now do so little trade with the peripheral countries that even if they did have a sudden increase in spending power, it wouldn't really work its way through to the deficit countries. I don't think there's much point asking the Germans suddenly to agree euro bonds either. I mean, that's been done to death. Uh, and it, not even France uh, tries that on, uh, because firstly they think it's immoral and an invitation to moral hazard to share their debts and their credit standing with their neighbours, and you can argue about whether they're right or wrong, but that's the way they think. And, and secondly, they do think, and I think they've got a point here, that their own credit standing is pretty fragile. The, the, my point about the Germans is that whenever foreigners think they're on the whole strong, they're weak. Uh, and when foreigners think they're weak, they're strong. And there have been a number of cases going back to 1870 where this has been the case, particularly after German unification. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher and Mitterrand both thought the Germans were going to trample over everybody else in jackboots. In fact, they were relatively weak at the time. Um, when Chancellor Schroeder was doing his reforms, um, I, I tended to think that ge the Germans were going to become stronger. Everybody thought that they were pretty hopeless at that time. Um, down to their last Bratwurst, uh, you know, almost accepting care packets from, from Britain, uh, so badly done by were they. So the foreigners always get it wrong, and I think the foreigners tend to overestimate German strength now, and I think the Germans are actually in a pretty fragile state, not least because uh, they are owed 1,000 billion euros by the rest of the world. Having a lot of, um, having a lot of claims on the rest of the world can sometimes be almost as bad, not quite as bad, as having a lot of debts. And I think the Germans are in this uncomfortable position, which is wholly their fault, of having got into this remarkably high creditor position, and people won't pay them back. Uh, so the Germans are not in the mood, I think, to, to ride to Europe's uh, rescue. I don't think that we are going to go down towards a proper political union. In my book, I put forward a 10-point plan, which you could say is just typical perfidious Albion, because clearly I don't think it's going to happen. But I think if people wanted to have a proper monetary union, they should have thought about this at the beginning. I mean, many, many people have said, many intelligent people, that unless you have a proper political union, 
monetary union work, work that's been the lesson of history uh, for, for thousands of years. So it, it's a commonplace to say that, that you should have a political union, and I would say those countries that would like to do it should, should go on and do it. To that extent, I do uh, side with what I think both major parties in the UK are uh, saying now. What will happen next? And I, I don't foresee that this thing will come to any speedy ending. Um, I foresee a constant uh, low-level belligerency, a little bit like in George Orwell's 1984, where there's a constant rumbling war going on. Nobody quite knows how it started. Nobody knows how the uh, conflict is being prosecuted. Nobody knows how it will end. Uh, the only thing that somehow unites the adversaries is the common view that neither will survive unscathed. And I think that, I'm afraid, sums it up in the struggle that we have between creditors and debtors. I don't think the Germans will leave the euro. I don't think the outsiders will leave the euro because it's still the key to large swathes of money coming their way. I've said for several years that if Ireland wants to, Ireland will stay in the euro. And I've I've always thought the Irish people are strong and resilient uh, and realistic enough to know that they had a party a few years earlier and now comes the hangover. I, I think the Irish people are pretty well educated about things like that, also having gone through quite a number of vicissitudes since the Second World War. And I've also been on record by saying better to have eight years of the Troika than 800 years of the English. You, you don't really want to go back to the pound because I would have thought that would be the... The, the main alternative. So I would certainly put Ireland in a different camp and much more realistic and much more grown up, if you like, than the other countries that are known of uh, as the periphery. But I think it's quite likely that they will stumble on. Um, one or two may, may leave. It won't really make much difference to the whole thing. We will still have a euro in, in a few years' time. My, my view is that the euro will be uh, possibly more stable than it is now, but it will be narrower and a lot less ambitious. And the final words in, in the book, I, I say we should prepare for neither resounding success nor catastrophic failure, but instead for a further drawn-out phase of standoff, slowdown and stalemate. So I don't know whether this sounds like the kind of book you'd like to take off with you to the beach, because it could be that if you read this book, you would certainly want to go into the water and, and drown. So I don't necessarily recommend you to, to, to do this. Uh, but I, but I think, rather than waste our energy and our efforts by asking the Germans to do all sorts of impossible things that I don't think they're going to do, we should try to adjust to a future uh, which is not going to be successful, but will not be one of absolutely resounding failure. The big worry, of course, is that while Europe stagnates, other parts of the world, particularly in Asia, are drawing ahead. But that, I would say, is another discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.